It is great to see everyone this morning. It's good to have our visitors with us today. You know, I don't have to tell you this, but a Christian lives in an evil environment. If you don't believe me, just turn on the TV and watch the news. It's filled with all kinds of things that's going on in this world. We live in a world full of sex and murder and deceit and greed and you name it. We're guilty of it. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12, in our scripture reading this morning, Paul admonishes us to be alert and to be active. And this admonition to activity is expressed in three words that we're going to be looking at in our lesson this morning. The words flee, follow, and fight. Now the term flee simply means to seek safety by flight or to avoid by flight. Sin is our most dangerous and deadly enemy because it does bring about eternal death. And our surest safety is in flight. We are to flee the lust and the temptations of sin. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So let's make sure that we take advantage of what God has provided for us so that we can escape this calamity called, called sin. In fact, we need to flee this sin like it was a hungry lion. You know, the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know that word devour literally means to drink down? Satan will drink you down like a glass of water. He is a very dangerous foe. He's very powerful, and he is not to be messed with. In verses 9 and 10 of 1 Timothy 6, we're warned to flee from the love of money and the evils that go along with it. And, you know, eagerness for riches makes a person a very sordid or dirty individual and very selfish and the danger is described by Paul here in three figures. Now, this danger is expressed in the figure of a drowning man in verse 9, which he says, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And you notice that he gives two examples here of two men that did that very thing. In the very first part of this letter to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, listen to what Paul tells Timothy. He says, hold to faith and a good conscience which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And he names them by name. He says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now these two men, they had become consumed with sin. And you know, sin, it brings about poverty and ruin and destruction and shame, not upon those, just those who do it, but also upon their families. Sin has an effect on men where sometimes it makes it very difficult for us to even turn from it. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, this no doubt being a description of a Christian, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Sins like adultery, gambling, pornography, these are very, very addictive sins. These are some that, some that people can't not really repent of, or you might say refuse to repent of, because they are so addictive. So the sensible thing is, never get involved with, in them to start with. Now this danger is also, or this danger of sin is also depicted as a figure in a tree. Notice he says, the love of money is a root of all evil. Remember Roy Deaver always stressing the fact that the definite article, the, there is not in the original text. The love of money is not the root of all evil, but it is a root of all evil. Now, once you notice the fruits of this money tree, 
The first fruit that Paul discusses here is the word unbelief. You see, the love of money causes a person to lose sight of their God. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 tells us where our focus ought to be. There he says, Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, no doubt talking about the Old Testament worthies in the previous chapter, he says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And notice this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we focus on Christ and everything else in this world, it kind of just blends into the background. They fade away. Another fruit of this money tree is called sorrow. Contrary to what many people believe, money cannot buy happiness. Listen to the wise man back in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 8. He says, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And then in verse 13 he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Happiness is found only in the God of heaven not in the God of money. Destruction is another fruit of this money tree. Materialism can actually cause you to trust in uncertain riches. But you know, Jesus told us where we're to focus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, there in the great Sermon on the Mount. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He tells us where we need to be putting our treasures, not here on this earth. We lay them up here on this earth, they're going to be gone before long. They're going to belong to somebody else when we leave this earth. We're to lay up our treasures in heaven. If we love money to the point that it becomes our God, what's going to happen when it's taken away from us? We won't have anything left. Remember back in the Great Depression when the stock market crashed? People jumped from buildings to their death because they had put all of their trust in these uncertain riches and all of a sudden they were gone and they had nothing left. How sad. Perdition is another fruit of greed. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 19. You see, this perdition brings about utter destruction, ruin, even the loss of our soul. Let's go to Matthew 19, and let's notice the story of this rich young ruler there in verses 16 through 24. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, talking to Jesus, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus to his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Here is a man that was so close to salvation, and yet his love of possessions and riches were his downfall. Now this love of money is also depicted in another figure, and that's of an entrapped animal. Paul says they fall into a snare, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. And this is just another description of its addiction. And it describes this animal that is caught unawares in a trap. 
It refers to the many pains and agonies and troubles that attend to money seeking. Now Paul says these are the things that we are to flee. But once we flee these things, we're going to also have to fill the void. That brings us to the word follow. This word follow is translated from a Greek word that means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or something. To run after, to pursue, to seek eagerly. Now if fear is on one hand, then eagerness of desire is to be on the other. We are to pursue the good things of this life in an effort to attain them. Now my question to you is, how bad do we desire heaven? Do we really want to go to heaven? Remember, heaven requires some effort and it requires some time. It's not something that just comes automatically to us. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 24? Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For I say, many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. That word strive means there's going to have to be some serious effort put into going to heaven. It's not an automatic. We are not automatons and we're not robots. There is a choice that we have to make in order to get to heaven. You know, life's best prizes are those that come as a result of earnest efforts. This is why we find so many kids today that are so unappreciative of the things that they get. Because they don't have to work for them anymore. They're just handed to them on a silver platter. And that's why we find so many church members today who have this lackadaisical attitude. They have this welfare attitude. Hey, give it to me because I deserve it. That's not what Jesus teaches. He says, strive to enter in at that straight gate. So Paul says, let's follow after these things. Follow after righteousness. And this, this deals with the, the, uh, our dealings with the fellow man and also with God. It is correctness in thinking and feeling and action. Remember what Solomon said in Proverbs 14, verse 34? Righteousness exalteth the nation. The sin is a reproach to any people. Look at the nations all throughout history, the great empires of this world. Rome, look at the nation of Israel. Look at our nation today, the United States. And how we have turned from righteousness. We have become vile and wicked and cruel. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 20? Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We've got to do better than those religious days, those religious leaders of Jesus' day. We're not to be self-righteous, but we are to be right toward God. This leads also to godliness. This has to do with our relationship to God. We are to cultivate, we are to promote development and growth in piety and reverence toward our God in heaven. David said long ago in Psalm 111 verse 9, He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. We need to forever love and revere God in our lives. And of course, we do this by keeping his commandments, John 14, verse 15. Paul also says we're to follow after faith. And this is the root of both right, righteousness and godliness. Let's take our Bibles now and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Remember, Paul tells us where we get our faith. It doesn't come out of thin air. Romans 10, verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing God's word. Faith is not found in the creation. We only know of Christ by the word of God. Let's notice what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. None of us have ever seen Jesus Christ. None of us have ever been able to sit at his feet and hear his teaching. And yet we believe in him because of faith. And that faith comes by hearing God's word. Another thing we're to add or follow after is love. And that is that which by faith works. Now this love that we're talking about here is agape love. It's a love that knows no bounds. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. In Romans 13, verse 8, he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Love is the whole purpose behind our preaching, behind church discipline. And if love is not there, if that's not the reason we are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to get out of the pulpit. It is for the love of people's souls that we tell them what they need to hear. It's not a popularity contest. It's for the salvation of your souls. Same thing goes with church discipline. We don't do it because we're mean-spirited. We're trying to help that soul that has gone astray to come back to the Lord so that his soul can be saved. And if love is not there... We're doing it all for the wrong reason. Patience. We need to follow after patience. This is certainly needed when, while we pursue all these other graces here. I don't know where I got this definition from, but I think it's a great definition of patience. It is that state of mind that enables one to face difficulties and obstacles that make him willing to toil and suffer adversity in order to maintain his loyalty to God. Remember Hebrews 12, verse 1? The writer there says, Be patient. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We should never become discouraged in our Christian walk because of the temptations and trials that come our way. We need to practice patience. Like James said in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. He says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold the husbandman, or the farmer, waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. And then he says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. We need to practice more patience. Help us through this life. And then meekness is another thing we need to follow after. And this should be the attitude that we have toward those who oppose us. Meekness is simply power under control. Meekness, is, of course, is something that suppresses our wrath against our enemies. It's not cowardice. Remember, Jesus Christ was the epitome of meekness, and he was no coward. Remember, he cleansed the temple twice by himself, and no one opposed him in doing so. Power under control. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 24, verse 19, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. In other words, let's not lose our cool. Let's be strong in the faith. Let's practice meekness. Now, when we pursue these graces, we'll find ourselves in the company of wonderful people all striving for the same goal. As Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.15, we have to continue in faith, in charity, in holiness, with sobriety. We have to do it God's way. Now once we have fled certain things, and now that we have learned what to fill the void with, the next thing that we have to do is we have to fight. So the figure now changes from a runner to a pugilist or a boxer. We are to flee from the temptations of this world, but there are some times that we're going to have to stand up, stand our ground, and fight. The reason is because our enemy is threefold. First of all, 
one of the enemies we have to face is external, talking about the world. Remember the words of John in 1 John 2, verse 15? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. These are three of Satan's greatest tools that he uses. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He used them on the first pair there in the garden, Adam and Eve. And that's what he tempted her with when he tempted her with the fruit of the tree. It's the same thing he's still using on people today, and people are still falling to that same tactic. Look at the beer commercials we see on TV today. Hey, you drink our beer, you're going to have all these beautiful women around you, the lust of the eyes. Not only that, but they'll also be half naked, or in biblical terms, they're completely naked, the lust of the flesh. If you drink our beer, then you're going to be a man. Everybody's going to look up to you, the pride of life. And people still fall for those same tactics today. Satan's very good at what he does. It's something that he hasn't really changed his tactics very much, I guess because they're still effective. Another enemy of ours is internal. Talking about the flesh. This deals with the desires of the flesh. In Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, if you remember, Paul uses some language there. Sometimes it's hard to follow along. It's really hard to read sometimes. But uh, he talks about the things that, you know, he knows he should not sin, but yet he does it anyway. Or he knows that he should be doing some good things, but he refuses to do them anyway. The desires of the flesh have a very powerful pull on mankind. Paul struggled with them. We all struggle with them. It's another enemy that we have to face. And then the third enemy we have to face is what we call infernal, the devil himself. We're told in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, how the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts of the field which the Lord God made. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, that Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan works on your mind. So you can't rely upon your own judgments or your own feelings. We need a standard. Peter says the devil is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Let's take our Bibles now and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Because this enemy is so strong, we need to be able to arm ourselves with the divine panoply, the whole armor of God. And Paul describes that very armor for us in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. If you notice that our armor, our spiritual armor, is provided by God's word. Each piece of that armor is given to us by God's word. And it's very effective against the wiles of the devil. It will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. But we can't withstand Satan without this armor. You notice whenever Jesus was tempted by Satan there in Matthew chapter 4, he didn't rely upon his miraculous power to overcome Satan, did he? He used the power of the word. Every time he was tempted by Satan, his response was, it is written. And you know what happened? At the end, Satan left him. 
Friends, eternal life is not placed within our hands, but it is within our reach. But we have to reach out and we have to lay hold of it. We need to follow Paul's admonitions here in our text this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. We need to flee the things of this world, the sin of this world. We need to follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness. And we need to fight the good fight of faith. Now the only way you can actually fight this fight is you have to be enlisted in God's army. And the only way you can get into God's army is you have to get there by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be in God's army, you're in God's family. And we're born by water and the Spirit, John chapter 3, verse 5. If you're not a child of God and you're a believer in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and you're willing to confess that faith, to repent of your sins, to turn from that evil of this way, to flee from the evil of this world, then won't you be baptized into Christ this morning? It's the only way to obtain all spiritual blessings, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It's the only place we can obtain salvation, 1 Timothy 2, verse 10 is to be in Christ Jesus. If you are a child of God and maybe you have not fled the things you should, maybe you're not following after things you need to follow after, maybe you're not fighting the good fight of faith as you should, if you need the prayers of this congregation to help build you up, we'd be glad to pray with you and for you. If there's anything that we can help you with this morning, we encourage you to respond to the invitation while together we stand and sing.